but again, uh, I'm a freelance throwing coach and um, yeah, coaching teams this season like Liverpool FC, Ajax from Holland, again from Belgium, FC Midland from Denmark, Atlanta United from the MLS. So um, the reason why I, I, I was a throwing coach was because I was being a football player myself, played on the highest Euro 19 level in, in Denmark, also played against good players like Thomas Graveson, who later played for Celtic, uh, Hamburg, Sports for Ryan, also Real Madrid. So, but I wasn't good enough to be a pro player. So I went to athletics, came on the national team there, was on the national team for six years, running run 100, 200, 400 meters. Went straight into the bobsleigh sport from 2002 to 2006. And uh, it was in the middle of that bobsleigh period in 2004, I thought, hey, if I can make a good throw in myself when I was a football player, couldn't I be a throwing coach then? So I went down to my local library in in Skive, Denmark, where I'm living, and tried to find that book about the throw-ins, but there were, were no books at all, so and nothing serious on the internet. So I used approximately six months to make a, a throw-in course, and I could have been starting with an amateur team or a youth team, but yeah, I, I had the courage to ask a, a local Superliga team from Denmark called Vibo. And yeah, they said yes. And uh, they scored a lot of goals after throwing situations and yeah, improved the throw-ins a lot and had the best placements in, in the club's history. So um, yeah, that was my first pro club and first club at all uh, as a throwing coach. The year after it was uh, FC Midtjylland, one of the best clubs in Denmark, currently number one in Denmark too. And then since then I've been coaching a lot of different uh, pro clubs. Of course, the real big breakthrough came in July 2018, where Jürgen Klopp called me directly. It was in the, in the middle of a summer trip with my family. So suddenly he was on my, my voicemail. Jürgen Klopp invited me to Melwood the week after, because as Jürgen Klopp said himself, we had a, we had a, Fantastic season in the 17-18 season, but uh, we lost a lot of balls after throwing situations. So, yeah, he invited me to Melwood. I got the chance to to coach a lot of uh, 21 of the um, Premier League players already the day after the meeting, and, and a couple of days after I signed a contract with with Liverpool FC. So uh, the last two seasons I've been working with with Liverpool FC and. Um, what I'm coaching in Liverpool FC is is my philosophy called uh, the long, the fast, and the clever throw-ins. And I'll say again, if you have any questions for me, put it either in the chat or even better in the Q and A questions and and answers down in the bottom. But I'll um, explain my my throw-in philosophy: the long, the fast, and the clever throw-ins. First of all, the long throw-ins. Here I'm I'm uh, learning the players how to throw longer. Uh, I'm using 30 different technical aspects and parameters, and I'm also using video analysis. So it's primarily technical training. I'm learning the players how to throw more efficient. Uh, most of my players, when they're coaching with me in a period, are improving between between 5 and 10 meters and some up to 15 meters. For example, I had a, a young guy called Andreas Paulsen from FC Midtjylland who improved from uh, 24.25 meters to 37.90 meters, so 13 meters and 65. He was sold in to Borussia and Gladbach in, in June 2018 for, I think it was 3 million pounds or so, uh, 4 million euros. So, um, yeah, <clears throat> you can really improve your long throwing. Why should you uh, do long throwing coaching? Yes, of course, some of you might know that some teams, if they're big and physical and strong, they can really use it as a set piece weapon the long throw in like like um stoked it back in the days and and for example not this season but the last four seasons fc midland scored uh, 35 goals after the long throw in uh, when i was coaching them so uh, you can have success with the long throw in if you're a big and strong team but 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 it's really important for all teams to to do long throwing coaching and why is that it's because the longer throw in you have, the greater throw in area you have to. And let's take on the ball here. If you only have a, a 20 meter throw in, then you only have this throw in area. 
But if you have a 35 meter throw in, then you have a much greater throw in error. And it means that, first of all, you are having uh, many more options on the pitch if, if you have a greater throw in error. But also, on the other hand, you can say that, that uh, the smaller throw in error you have, uh, the easier it is for the opponents to put you under pressure. And let me give you an example. For example, when I started with, with uh, Liverpool, uh, Andy Robert, Robertson or Robo could only throw 19 meters with a normal throw in. But after a few sessions, he could throw 27 meters. So even though uh, eight meters improvement uh, is really, really good, you can say that his throwing error was improving with over 500 square meters. So that was even more important because back in the days before I coached him in the long throwing, it was really easy to put pressure on Liverpool when they had a throw in from, uh, from Robo at the left side. So now he's really improved. So, so even though he'll never be one of the world's best at the long throw in, it's really important for him as a fullback to improve the throw in area. So I'm coaching the long throw in in clubs like Liverpool and Ajax, even though we're not doing any long throw in uh, throw ins towards the opponent's goal. Then we have the second part of my throw in philosophy. And that's the fast throwing. And the fast throwing is both how can we mark the opponents when they have a throw in. It's all about being mental ready, but also with communication, uh, body language, uh, body signals, and everything. Um, but the uh, fast throwing is also about how can we throw the ball fast when we have a throw in ourselves. And some might think that, hey, uh, then it's all about throwing fast. No, because sometimes throwing fast can be the worst. Thing you can do because if you're throwing into a pressure zone it's really really bad so in drills i'm learning my players to decide when to throw fast and when to wait sometimes it's better to have patience in 8 10 12 seconds then the third part of the uh, fast throwing is uh, counter-attack throwings you can't be offside on the throwing so often it gives you a, a really good uh, opportunity to throw down in the back room of course First of all, you can't do it every time. And the second thing is that you can't just run down there. It's also about running patterns and so, but the fast throwing is really important. Then the third part of my throwing philosophy is the clever throwing. And uh, I'm working with uh, three different zones and 40 to 50 different throwing tools. So 10, 12, 15 tools in each zone. And it's the, Defending zone, middle zone, and attacking zone. And they're all about creating space. How can we create space uh, when we have a throw in under pressure where all the players are marked? So uh, that's really, really important. On top of that, I have individual assignments for each player because some players have some, I call them throw in superpowers. Some players are fast. Some players are good with the first touch. Some players are good at protecting the ball. Some players are good at creating space for the teammates. So we're also using that. And on top of that, the players themselves are using their own imagination and, and fantasy and creativity. So it's not like a like an American football playbook where we can only do one thing, but it's more like the players are taking my basic knowledge and training around the throw-ins. They're taking my throw-in tools and then they are deciding themselves. So in other words, you can say that I'm, I'm improving the player's uh, throwing intelligence. So uh, instead of a few options, we have, yeah, millions of options when we're playing with Liverpool or when I'm coaching other clubs. Um, I'm just looking after some questions here and I can see, uh, okay, there is a question here from John. Is coaching throw-ins in attack only or how to defend as well? Yeah, you can say I was a little bit into it here, but, but I'm coaching everything around the throw-ins. Um, it's both when we have to throw in ourselves, so attacking throw-ins, but it's, it's, um, it's all, also defending throw-ins. Even though I'll say I'm perhaps using 80% of the time on our own throw-ins and then then 20% uh, of the time on, on when the opponents have a throw-in. And it's not because it's less important when the opponents have a throw-in. It's just that that uh, when we have it ourselves, attacking throw-ins, it's more complicated. It's more complex. So, uh, of course, it, it isn't easy to take the ball from the opponents when they have a throw-in, but it's, it's not so complex as the attacking throw-ins. Um, next question here. <clears throat> um 
Yes, okay. We, we'll take it over here in the Q&A. Sorry. Sorry, we'll take it here. Um, yes, we had that question. Handle throw-ins from the opponents. Uh, what technical detail constitutes uh, efficient throwing? Of course, I can't come into all the into all the 30 different parameters. That's too complex. But I put the 30 different parameters up in in three different areas. First of all, um, I'm looking at the running, and and it's really important that the running is is not too jumpy. I see some players with a throw-in running just before they had to do they do the throw-in, or they come in a big jump and that's that's not so good so we want to uh, the the running to be so efficient as possible with with energy this way then i have the second thing and uh, my second focus is the power position and um the power position that's the position you have when you're coming to the line when you're at the power position you really want to have the right distance between the feet you really want to have uh long reach behind the head you want to have tension going from from the last leg through the body and all the way there there are a lot of small technical things like like the chest the hip the a lot of different things but i'm i'm learning the players to have the right position when on when they're on the line and then the third thing i'm focusing on with with the long throwing technique is how can we transfer the energy over the line when when the player has delivered the throw in how can they in uh, the same fluent movement go over the line afterwards and you can just say oh it's just about going over the line no it's not just about going over the line because you can go over the line in the wrong way so you're actually throwing shorter than you did before so that's what i'm learning the players with with um with my my technical coaching we'll see i'll look after another question here um Yes, um, I have one here. Hi, Thomas. I'm interested to know um, what age did you realize you had a long throw in, and um, did your U team use your weapon for set pieces? Yes. First of all, um, my teams used used my own uh, long throw in with, when I was a football player. I realized I had a long throw in because as a kid I saw my big cousin spend and Johnny. Uh, do the long throw in so as a teenager i'll really try to be better with the technique so um but that was many years uh before i, I was a throwing coach myself but yes uh, i used it myself and i re realized it as a teenager uh question from mark what areas on the pitch do you focus on do you focus on them all when in possession yes i'm focusing on on all all areas on the pitch one of course i'm focused on three zones as i said before uh and these 40 to 50 throwing tools but i'm also focused on, on all areas when we have it in a specific zone so um i think it's really important to be open-minded to have a, a many options if you only have one option then then it can be be a really big challenge for you i see a lot of also the big teams in champions league premier league bundesliga and so on have either no real throwing strategy or a real simple one so if you have many options and the players know them then it's a big advantage for you so i'm focusing on all areas on the pitch um next question from uh Fikret. how do you train throwing sessions is it totally isolated sessions um or is it integrated into ssgs and such um a few times it's isolated into itself for example sometimes i can do specific things with the fullback group either some some precision work some technical work with a throwing or or switch technique or something like that but most of the times i'm working with all the players or in big groups it could for example be i'm playing nine players uh, four against four on a small pitch with one throw or with a secret thrower uh, and then after 25 minutes, I'm, I'm uh, working with the next group. It could also be a uh, five versus five interval game on big goals with two goalkeepers playing on a narrow pitch. So we have a lot of throw-ins. And then we are, in this game, we are really doing, uh, rehearsing our different throw-in tools. The players are taking their own 
uh, choices and so. And then after two minutes, we're switching. Then it's two new teams. So in that exercise, it's 22 players in, in one time switching in the intervals. It could also be 11 versus 11 uh, on a big big pitch with with the full uh, match intensity. For example, taking five throw-ins in each zone, uh, 15 in all, and then playing playing on after the throw-in. So yeah, um, so sometimes it's isolated, but most of the time uh, I'm doing it in normal training. And there are also integrated passes, goal scoring, if the goalkeeper's on, it's like saving the shot and so. So that's also the reason why I'm, I'm, it's not like normal set-piece training that, that it's only Friday before the match started, Saturday. No, it can be done all week, but mostly I'm, I'm coaching the the teams or players on on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. So um, yeah. Then I'll see the next question here. How did you develop your mythology? Have you? Uh, sorry, it just went a little bit up here. And have you documented in a book or PDF that you can that can be shared per case? I'll say that the. The way I did the first, the first four seasons or four years, I focused only on the long throw-ins. But then suddenly I was, I was uh, seeing a match just for long throw-ins, and yeah, then my team had a throw-in in the middle of the pitch, and um, yeah, they they lost the ball, and then I just thought, hey, that was bad. Then they lost the next one, the next one, and I thought, hey, I thought it was only at at amateur and youth level that they were so bad at the throw-ins. So I started analyzing. Uh, the throw-ins all over the pitch. And I realized that most teams had possession in under 50% of the circumstances when they had a throw-in under pressure, so where all the players are marked. So uh, that's where I started my, my long, fast and clever throw-in philosophy. And again, at the moment, I don't have any anything that I can give to you right now. At the moment, I can only like share the big secrets with my club. But I'm um, I'm writing on a book about the long, fast, and clever throw-ins. I don't know when it will be published, but if you go to my homepage, thomasgronemark.com, you can uh, read about my coaching, read about my coming book, read about my upcoming online courses, and so. So uh, in the future, I'll share uh, all my secrets with coaches all over the world because, of course, it's fascinating to to coach big, big clubs and pro teams and winning Champions League and so. But but my biggest uh, dream is to change the football world. So go into thomasgronemark.com. Uh, yeah, you can sign up and everything, but also just read about it if you want to. So, um, yeah, but in the future, I'll have uh, PDFs or and, and a book. I'll have courses and, and everything else. Uh, next question here. Let's see. Uh, yeah. It's from Dave. Has your work remained in the first team setup or has it been taken on by the 23's younger age groups and academy? In many, um, in many clubs, I'm working with, with um, the younger team. So, for example, in, in Ajax, I've been working with the young Ajax, they call it, the young second team, but also the U U16s. In Liverpool, I've been working with not only the Premier League, I've worked work most with the Premier League, but also work with U23 many times, U18, U16. But also, for example, in uh, I think it was week 44 in 19 here, I had a whole week where I was educating uh, the whole coaching staff from Liverpool. And it was all from U10s up to yeah U23s. So I had four days where I was coaching all the players, not only about the long throw-ins, because that's only a small, small thing, but, but mostly about the the fast and the clever throw-ins, both with with talks, but also with practical stuff on the pitch. And of course, it was different teams who, who were, were with me every day. So if I can, and of course, it's not my choice when I come into a club, but but if I can decide myself, I also want to work with the with the young players too, because let's say let's say Liverpool, Nico Williams, he was playing on U18, and then young guy also playing U23. He, he had some some matches in the first team in Liverpool. If he couldn't, didn't know about the, the throwing and how we are doing the tools and what's important, and, and he, if he wasn't training himself, then he would be in difficulties when he came to the first team. So in general, I always think it's a good thing in the club, no matter if it's throwing or not things, that we are doing it all the way from the small kids up to, to the first team. Um, 
Yeah, let's see the next question here. Um, yes, uh, from a guy called Anonymous, uh, there's a question. Uh, do you do a review of the matches? of all the throw-ins with the players, or do you do with the technical team and, and players? I do both. Uh, in Liverpool and Ajax, I have a full season contract, six to seven visits per season, but I'm also doing video analysis of of, um, of every match. So, and then I'm sending analysis back to, for example, in Liverpool, uh, Jürgen Klopp, or if it's Ajax, it's Eric Ten Hag. And then uh, when I'm not there in the weeks, they're using my analysis to, to yeah, improve the throw-ins when I'm not there. But also when I'm in the club, I'm having talks. It could be for the coaches, the managers. It could be a longer talk, 45 minutes, an hour. But it could also just be a, a short talk for the players, 10, 15 minutes, just showing them seven videos. What did we do well? What didn't we do so well? So, uh, yes, so I'm, I'm also focusing on, um, on the analysis part of it. So you can also say that, one of the things I'm doing, the first two visits in a club, I'm doing general things like longer throw-in, more precise throw-in, but also general awareness of how do you create space and a throw-in under pressure. And when I'm coming to the next visits, then it's both my 40-50 throw-in tools, but I'm also using my throw-in analysis in, um, from, from the video to spe do specific training for, for both the teams, but also individual players. Uh, what type of data do you collect from data? Uh, chances created, possession loss, possession control, play switch. Do you collect this data and what type do you collect? First of all, I'll say I really, I'm really fascinated about analysis and video analysis. I did a lot of um, analysis as a bobsleigh driver. I won't really come into that, but I was that for four years. I've been doing a lot of individual analysis of the players, improving their throwing, but also seeing thousands of games with, with the throw-ins. I'll say I'm not an uh, educated data man, so, uh, but I'm, what I'm looking at when I analyze throw-ins, I'm looking at things that work. And, and I know with my experience seeing thousands of games with throw-ins, what works and what doesn't work. But what I'm looking at specifically is to, uh, when do we come out of pressure? Um, so when I'm looking at lost possession or kept possession, in my numbers, I'm looking at do we keep the ball or do we lose the ball? And I'm not measuring three passes or five seconds because, because sometimes we can have, uh, have three passes and then we're still in like total pressure situation. And I'm not measuring seconds because, yeah, sometimes we can keep it or lose it after five seconds and it, and it hasn't done us good. So, so I try to, to look at when do we get out of the pressure or when do we stay in the pressure. And of course, sometimes it's pretty uh, clear to see that we are out of the pressure. Sometimes it's pretty clear to see that we, are, we lost the ball and sometimes we're in a gray area. And, there, and then I'm trying to be so objective as, as possible. So that's my numbers. Liverpool have their own numbers and they're doing it their way. I don't necessarily uh, share, uh, you know, uh, or, or I don't necessarily get their numbers. But if I have to highlight a number, there's a number from uh, T for Football. You can see it on my webpage, this video. It also It's also on YouTube. But if they research uh, throw-ins under pressure in the European leagues, and they found out that in the in the season, 17-18 season, before I came to Liverpool, Liverpool had a possession on 45 point, um, 4% at throw-ins under pressure where every player is marked. So Liverpool in 17-18 season, they were number 18 out of 20 in the Premier League third last. In my first season in, in the 18-19 uh, season, we improved to 68.4%, so upwards 23% points, and went from number 18 in the Premier League to, uh, to number one in the Premier League at throw-ins under pressure. So yes, that's T for football's numbers, and of course I'm, I'm proud of them. But I think if you're asking almost every data analysis or analysis, uh, man or woman, they'll, they'll you know, measure, measure data in different ways. So, but I'm looking, back to your question, I'm looking at when do we uh, get out of the pressure? If we're getting out of the pressure, it's a kept possession. If we are not out of the pressure and the opponents are taking the ball, then it's a lost possession. Um, 
I think I have been into the technical aspects of the long throwing, so I won't take that again. Um, what this is question from Jesper. What position? Sorry, jump again here. What position on the sideline is the most dangerous to get the correct angle on the throw in? Uh, I don't know if you're, uh, if I know it, uh, I understand it perfectly, but I think perhaps you're asking about what uh, throwing is the most dangerous to have. And I, I, now, first of all, I'm, I'm saying, um, I'm saying when you have a throw in yourself, if you have a throw in at your own penalty area, um, then it's really dangerous because you have a short angle, you have high pressure. So that's really dangerous. If yes, but if you meant, uh, if you meant the long throw in towards the opponent's goal, what's the, the most dangerous? I'd say if you have a long throw in this way, if you're all the way down to the corner flag, it's not so dangerous because it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit too tight there. So if, if I'll say something, I'll say that it's best to have it like 10, 12 meters from the corner flag because then you can have different angles into the into the penalty area. So, uh, but I'll say again, if you want to score from a long throw in, it's important that it's not only long, but it also has to be flat and fast. Um, you might remember uh, the throw in assist from uh, Joe Gomez in the national match between um, Cro uh, sorry England and Croatia. And you saw his long throw in. It was not only long, it was also flat and fast. I see a lot of long throwers uh, yeah, in, in modern football, but also amateur and youth football. If they're throwing long, it's way too high, and then it's coming down again. It's easy, too easy to defend for yeah, the defenders, the opponents, but also too easy for the goalkeeper to, to grab. So if you're one of the teams who want to really do long throw-ins, then it's uh, really important that the thrower has a, not only long, but also flat and fast throwing, and you're also doing the... A lot of different tactical uh, ways of doing the long throw in. So you have to have at least five, six, eight, ten different options before it can be really dangerous. But I'll also say if you want to um, really use the long throw in, you, I think you, you need a, a big and strong and, and uh, yeah, tall team. So, and I'll say that. For example, in Ajax, also in Liverpool, we're not doing any long throw ins towards the opponent's goal. Not because it's wrong, but it's just not fitting into the club's playing style. Next question here, let's find one. Ba, 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 ba. Um, yeah, uh, question from Mark. Is it also influenced by the philosophy of the team? Maybe a ball possession orientated team, quick the ball. Yeah, I, I, of course it, it, it means a lot. One of the reasons why we're not doing so many long throw-ins in, in in Liverpool is because we are like a fast team, fast style of play. And we could easily in Liverpool score 10 uh, goals after long throw-ins in the Premier League. But we, if we had to do that, we you have to see 8, 10 long, 8, 10, 12 long throw-ins in each game at Anfield and, and in the away games. And that will slow the game down and also take other other uh, opportunities away. away. So, so, um, so I'm... I think it's it's really depending on what kind of playing style your team have it. So 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 some teams can really use the long throw-ins, and some teams are more like into the, in my philosophy, the fast and clever ones, where we are instead using the throw-ins all over the pitch to to create chances, score goals, and and keep possession. But I'm really using a lot of times to time to uh, talk with the manager, the coaches. So it's not like I'm coming and saying we have to do this. I'll say in, in in most teams, my coaching is the same in, in 60, 70, 80% of the circumstances. And then the last 20, 30%, that's really fitted into the club's playing style. Because as you mentioned um, in the question, I'll say that, that of course, some are playing with counter-attack, some are playing with pressing, some are playing really possession-based, and some are playing more defensive, but then going on more physical style and so so I really try to fit it into to a different um, different playing styles in different clubs a uh, question from Ma, uh, sorry Dan how much time is spent on improving throw-ins week to week practical video etc is this individual 
uh, one to more one or team based first of all i'll say the, most of the time is is team based um so um yeah uh, how much time do i spend i think i mentioned a little bit earlier that i'm that i'm using uh, have a full season contract with liverpool and ix I'm, I'm there six seven weeks per season and i'm coaching there two three training days it's not the whole training that's throw-ins but it's normally between 20 and 40 minutes so you can do a lot of other things when i'm there too uh, in other teams like for example Gens in belgium i have three four visits per season so that's a little bit less i'm not analyzing all the games there but only a few and then in other teams i'm, I'm only having an inspirational visit of two or three training days where i'm educating the coaches learning the best some stuff and so so of course you get get more from me when you have a full season contract but you can learn it in, in many different ways so i'll say if you are amateur or youth coach then um you don't have to to do throw-ins three times a week but if you have the the right drills the, the right things the right knowledge you can easily just do it do it 30 minutes per week or so that's that's easy and and i'll also say in in most of my drills it's yeah, they're integrated into normal play so so even though we're focusing on the throw-ins then players are are doing a lot of other things like like dribbling passing shooting on goal catching the ball if you're a goalkeeper and so so you don't have to use so much time as as you may think so to improve your throw-ins but again um i don't know if you were the one who asked there was it then um if you're amateur youth coach but but i'll do my best to uh to give you the knowledge through my book in the future um then there is a guy again one called anonymous uh, we have a lot of them today no just a few um how do you design a throw-in session yeah the way i design it is just i can't remember if i answered that but um in the in the start it's only the basic things like like uh, like throwing length precision basic space creation but then the, the way i'm designing a session is that i'm looking at video analysis if if it's the full season teams i have and then i'll really look at what can they improve now of course i always have some things i want to go through but i also have some very specific things so but everything is like talked through with the manager and with the assistant coaches and so i'm all, always also talking with uh the analysis guys too but also i'm also talking with with the physical coaches because if we have been playing on a sunday it's not i'm not sure that that we have to do a five versus five interval game uh, on a monday so i'm always asking the physical coaches what can we put on now also the managers and so but also what intensity can it be so that's the way i'm designing my um my uh, different uh, sessions um there's a question from tim what sort of triggers do players use to show they want the ball or are there key signals to throw gifts to let teammates know where to move or receive the ball? You can do it in two different ways. You are where you can either use triggers like hand signals or shout or make a nod or so, or but you can we're also doing it just by normal movement because we can we can do both because the players have been doing these movements so many times also in training, so they know if if the, this player is moving this way he'll either have free space or drag his opponent so we are having free space for another so some things are showed with triggers um but but a lot of things are just we are just doing that because the players have developed a very high throwing intelligence so they can just see the space being created um question from fran the use of bloggers is a clever ploy used for throw-ins thank you I also think it's clever. <laughs> Can you give us some example of this, please? And and what areas in, is this most effective? Thank you. Yeah, I've been playing a lot of street basketball myself, so I'm also using um, basketball things in my training with the blocks. Of course, I can't really reveal it how we're doing it, but I'll just say that we I'm using it in all three zones. It can be be a part of every movement on the pitch. Of course. You can just you can't just say to players hey uh try to use these blocks because if they're doing that football players they'll either make a free kick or obstruction or you know 
So I'm learning the players what to do just from the very basic start by how to set a block, how to do it right, how to time it, how to make body signals, when to set it. So so if you see one of my teams doing a block, it's not just to block or we just did that. There's a really lot of basic things you have to do before uh, you can even let a player do it in, in a match. So, but yes, um, many of my teams are using blocks. Um, what are the criteria to assess throw in progress? That's a question from Dan. Is it just pass completion rates and are there different criteria to analyze progress when it comes to defensive throw ins? You know, if I'm measuring it uh, with my clubs, I'm just saying uh, possession kept, possession lost, and that's both uh, attacking and defending. And as I mentioned before, I'm looking at, at at pressure situation. Can we get out of the pressure? Then we have been keeping the ball. Are we not getting out of pressure and losing the ball? Then it's a lost possession. And it's the same way with the opponents. That's just the way I measure it. Of course, um, I'm also looking after how many goals are we scoring uh, after throwing situations all around the pitch. For example, this season with Liverpool FC, we scored 13 goals after throwing situations all over the pitch. And it's in Liverpool, it's not the long throwing towards the opponent's goals. But for example, three of the 13 goals are after the opponent's throwing, and three of the 13 goals are also after uh, a throwing at their own penalty area. Because if you're you're getting on a real at a really, really big pressure, at a really, really big risk of, of what can happen if you lose the ball. But if you get out of this pressure, there are really big opportunities. So that's the way I'm, I'm measuring. Uh, if you're asking asking some analysis people, so they'll perhaps measure uh, on another way. I just think that, of course, there are no right way to measure things. Uh, but but again, as mentioned before, I, I just want to measure the things. I know that that works in 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 football regarding the throw-ins and, and possession chance and and, uh, and goals. I sometimes see some analysis people measuring things. I think that's different, oh, sorry, um, wrong. And, and, and for example, if you're measuring just all the throw-ins and possession, you'll have a lot of throw-ins without any pressure. So, so if there is an opponent 30 meters away from you, you throw it down to your, uh, to your center back, then it's a central defender, then it doesn't mean anything for the match. So if you're just measuring everybody, then then you, you think that, oh, we, we did pretty well, but perhaps you did pretty well because you had a lot of throw-ins without any pressure. So uh, I think from my point of perspective, the right thing is to m first of all measure possession, but also measure the throw-ins under pressure. But again, uh, I can only say what's important for me and. Um, I think it, it, it really works in the clubs I'm, I'm coaching. Um, it's a question from Ronnie. Um, how do you get all the team to engage and enjoy, in, enjoy practicing throw-ins as sometimes I found players switch off when they are not involved? I say, I'll say first of all, one of the most important things, not only in throwing coaching, but also in football in general or life in general, is to motivate people and, and, and give them the why. I can say what I said to the very first uh, training session in Liverpool. Um, I said to them, um, there are normally between 40 and 60 throw-ins in a match. Most teams, when they have a throw-in under pressure, they, they lose possession more than 50% of the occasions. If you had the same percentage of possession with your feet in the middle of the pitch, you will not be playing pro football, you will be playing Sunday league football. And I also said to the Liverpool players, I'm not going to make you into Stoke number two. With that, I meant we're not going to take a lot of long throw-ins. After me, Jurgen Klopp said that, yeah, uh, guys, we, we had a fantastic season last season with a fourth place in the Premier League and Champions League final, but we lost the ball uh, at almost every throw-in. We tried to do something. I tried to do something, but it didn't work. Now we have Thomas, who's here as a throwing coach, and I know it's a special job to have, but I'm 100% sure that, that he can help us um, being better at the throw-ins. So I'll say, first of all, I think all the Liverpool players uh, were really motivated there. They could, they could see a mean. Of course, they didn't really know what would happen because throwing coaching, what, what is that? So I think the first thing is to give meaning to the players in general. Then regarding my specific throwing coaching, I, I'm, I'm doing, uh, I'm using a lot of energy to make the, the, 
the thrills itself motivating and entertaining for the players not because it should only be entertaining because of course they have to learn to be better at the throw-ins but for example just a small thing like like uh, like a little reward if you have five passes or putting small goals into a drill that can really make a difference so but i also always try to to see how is this relevant to to the match but of course when i'm when i'm building up my exercises it's first like this really small basic exercise then we put more complexity more complexity and more complexity so i think again back to your questions it's it's really um first of all it's the why you have to give the players and also the drills uh, themselves should be motivating. So I do my best to do that. Um, yes, I think I had this question from Andrew. Perhaps sweet you train this aspect as a group and or individual. So most it's it's in groups, big groups or gigantic groups, and often it's like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in the start of the week. So it's not like normal set piece training that is. Friday before the match Saturday. Um, Robert Warner is asking, what do you recommend a quick throw, throw in or a player with a flip throw to get the ball in the box? I say I don't recommend the flip throw in. I know uh, in 2010 I set the world record, official Guinness world record myself with a flip throw in 51.33 meters, but I won't recommend the flip throw in because of course it's entertaining, but often the flip throw ins are, are way too high so um it's so easy to defend so if we're talking about long throw-ins it's just with a normal it's just with a normal running and um, but i'll say only use the long throw-in if you have like big players or really have a good strategy most of the time i'll, I'll say for many teams it's better to look into the fast and the clever throw-in so how can we create space in this part of the pitch so so we can keep possession create a chance to score a goal um andrew asks have you ever worked with goalkeepers specifically on distribution do the same principle apply for the different types of throw-ins no i'll just say i've been working with with the, the goalkeepers throw out um i've been doing that for example in rb leipzig when i was coaching them last season i'm also sometimes helping um goalkeepers individual with, with to to make a longer throw out for example i'm working on a with a secret uh, goalkeeper right now he's playing professional somewhere in europe he started he started with his throw out with 37 38 meters and that's pretty good that that's a little bit uh, over the, the halfway line from from the edge of the penalty box but he's in, been improving to 46 meters so uh, yeah so that's really good so that's eight ten meters over the penalty uh, sorry the, the 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 middle of the pitch so so yes i'm working with goalkeepers but when i've been doing that it's only with with uh, how to improve the throw out and i also say it's not in every club it's only when the club is asking me hey can you help our goalkeepers then i'm saying yes and and they 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 improve but i'm primarily focused on on the throw-ins and, and the long fast and clever throwing in in the club um let's see yeah ivan is asking can you talk about the patterns of the ball movements between a group of players yeah i can't really come much more into that because uh that, that there's a lot of secrets there but of course you can read about it in um in in my upcoming book or if you're hiring me or inviting me to your club so and i'll say to all of you out there um people might think that i'm only coaching coaching pro clubs often i'm also with amateur clubs or youth clubs but it's just like then there are perhaps two clubs are going together or they invite the entire club i'm also making a talk and so so don't be afraid of inviting me even though you're not a pro club uh let's just um rolling down because there are so many good questions and again i'll say thanks a lot for for all the questions it's really overwhelming i don't know uh, <laughs> 76 questions until now so i'll just try to scroll down and see um uh something that's not Okay, I had a good question here from Taylor. Hi, Thomas. Why do you think it's taking so long for elite teams to focus on throw-ins as a way of gaining an advantage control? And do you see the game going into having routines or plays as we now do with corners and free kicks? Yes, I think there's a big future for throw-ins. 
there are so many uh, people who are writing to me directly on mail, on LinkedIn, Twitter, direct messages uh, saying thank you for the new foods and throw-ins. I think one of the reasons why the focus is taking us along with the folks is because of, I think, football. If you look at the history, football has been really conservative. When I was on the national team in athletics uh, 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, also in bobsleigh, we were ages ahead of, of football with analysis, video analysis, focused on small details. But I think especially the two last two, three years in football, football has gone like this, just directly up. And um, there are so much knowledge now. And now a lot of people can can measure the throw-ins now, also throw-in possession, what happens, what's happening afterwards. So the interest has just grown. So yes, first of all, I think there'll be much, much more focus on the throw-ins in the future, but also on other, other uh, special things in football, smaller areas. And then again, I'll say some, some people are saying that throw-ins are, are um, are marginal gains, but I'll say it's really, really big gains because, as I mentioned before, 40 to 60 throw-ins in a match. And and another number that's perhaps even <laughs> bigger is that when I'm receiving the throw-ins from the Liverpool analysis people before I send it back to Jürgen and the other guys on the team, uh, I'm getting the attacking throw-ins and the defending throw-ins, two files. It's just a situation just before the throw-in or just before we get the ball and then the following situation that's affected by the throwing itself and these two video files are normally between seven and a half and and, and 10 minutes each so so 15 to 20 minutes of the game is either directly or indirectly affected by the things we're doing at the throw-ins and now we're not talking about small margins or small things it's really big in football but i think that that people are, are slowly realizing how important throw-ins are uh, I'm just scrolling again here, and um, and sorry if I'm scrolling through uh, questions that I haven't answered, but I just tried to to yeah. It's a question from Subin: Do I collaborate with analysis? Yeah, I corro corroborate with analysis in the uh, in in the different clubs. Of course, it's different from club to club. For example, a, a, a club like Liverpool have a lot of analysis people, gigantic data apartment. And sometimes I, I come to a, a small, for example, I've been coaching the last two seasons, a small um, Belgian club called uh, RUSG, Royal Union, they're also called Second League. And they only have one analysis guy who, who's doing everything. And of course, the cooperation between a gigantic department and then one guy, of course, it can be fantastic. It's fantastic both places, but w you can do different things with different resources. But yes, I'm using analysis and analysis people also from the clubs. Um, yes, let's see again. Well, what dictates where the ball goes? Yeah, it can both it, it can both be the throw itself, so but it could also be be just the movement that that um, that your po sorry the teammates are making. Uh, a few times, it's very few times we're doing something real specific, but most of the times it's up to the players' imagination, fantasy, creativity, and the way they're doing it. It's with the throwing intelligence because they've learned all the basic things around the throw-ins, but also the throwing tools. Um, let's see here. Uh, do you have specific throw-in patterns for particular opponents based on how they approach these situations? I normally I don't have it, or we don't have it, but there can be some specific things that the opponents are doing when they are marking. Like, for example, sono marking, man marking, or putting a guy on the thrower. It could also be specific things that the opponents are doing when they are doing the throw-in. So, um, but I'll say most of the time I'm focused on, on, on our own work um, when, when we are playing. So, but of course, there can be specific things uh, from the opponents. So, so we'll take that in consideration too. Uh, Okay, to uh, Stephen, a question from Stephen to further the ultimate frisbee question: If not ultimate frisbee, have you logged into other sports and how to create space for players on throw-ins? In general, I'm really fascinated about a lot of things, and I'm taking inspiration from many things, both uh, athletics with movements, bobsleighing, also with movements, but also with video analysis innovation. I'm also uh, 
getting inspiration from basketball. I've been playing a lot of street basketball myself. And uh, yeah, so I know the, know the movements there. I'm also taking inspiration from American football, some of the movements there. Um, but I'm, I'm taking inspiration from a lot of things in life in general. So suddenly, sometimes I just see a piece of art and I see like a line going this way and then I think, hey, how could this be transferred to to a throw-in pattern or so. So, so I, I really try to get inspiration many from many places. Uh, bop, 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 bop. Let's see another question here. So, uh, and again, thanks for all the um, fantastic question. Question from Noel. Is it possible to put curl on the ball? Is, is that legal also? Uh, yes, you can put curl on the ball. Uh, you could also put a side curl on the ball, but I won't, won't really recommend that. But you could put, uh, you could put um, top spin, uh, sorry, not top, you know, sorry, underspin on the on the ball when you're doing a long throwing because then it it helps with the with the flat uh, throwing. So so it's really good to put uh, put underspin on a on long throwing. Because it helps with the flatness, so you can you can curl the ball, but not uh, but not to the side. I won't recommend that. Um, do the players uh, react better on the theory? A question from Jet Jet Lee. Um, a throw in easier than open game situation. I thought the both had similar aspects, and if it could be benefit the team's open play game. Yes, I, th I think it's. Um, I think they react really good on throw-in situations and, and plays because it's it's a set piece. So we can we can decide what to do: throw fast, wait, how to move. So you have a little bit more control on the over set piece situation, and especially because we have four to sixty throw-ins. So um, so yeah, I think that there's a big chance of of. Um, yeah, I've taken it into the pitch. It's a little bit easier than if you're just in open play in the middle of the pitch, I think. So so they're taking really, really well. Um, yeah, take my advice really well. Um, let's see, next question. Yeah, hi, Thomas from Andrew. Thank you for sharing. What type of work do you do around the player receiving the throw in and the player supporting the next ball, please? For example, what body parts to receive movements for the flick on and so. I say most of the time uh, it's best to throw to the feet. Uh, but what I see a lot of times also in pro football is that the ball comes to 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 uh, to the knees, to the hip, to the chest, and it's really bad. So one of the things you can do as an amateur coach, youth coach, or even a pro coach is to do a lot of um, specific precision exercise because especially with the throw-ins from five to 15 meters from the thrower, that's really important. A lot of ball loss and loss possession is made because of undersized throw-ins. So it's really important. Of course, there's a few times you have to throw to the head, but mostly you don't. I'll say most times it's only when you have to do a long throw-in. I know there's a lot of uh, clubs who are throwing a lot down the line, but that's the worst thing you can do if you don't have a real strategy for it. Often you lose the duel, and if you win the duel, often flick it on to the central defense of the opponent. So. Most we we have to go after um, most after the, the feet. The next question from Joe here: Ski elements for eight to ten year old players. I'll go back again to to um, to I'll focus on making the players do a right throwing, correct throwing, and then I'll focus on the last thing I said about throwing precision. So can you learn the players to throw precise? And you, of course you can learn your kids to do that. Then it's a much better chance to to um, to keep the ball, and then I'll also learn the players to move because most players, also pro players, are standing still or only moving one or two meters. Then you're not dragging the opponent. So just learn your kids to move. Just learn them to move eight, ten, twelve meters when there is a throw in, and then then uh, try to make your players throw into the free space. And then it's really important when you're learning the kids. On, of course, it's not only when you're coaching throw-ins but it's really important to learn the kids um, that it's okay to make make a mistake because if they don't dare to make a mistake then they don't dare to throw into the free space so have a lot of patience with the kids make them do a correct throw-in make them throw precise and then make them move then uh, they'll also have fun when when they have a throw-in a lot of kids are really afraid of taking a throw-in because they're afraid of doing it wrong or they're afraid of that the coach is, is being angry because a lot of kids 
are, are losing the ball at a throw in. So yeah, be generous, be kind, and, and just try to work on these things I said here. Um, what age do you think it's appropriate to start throwing coaching? Yeah, you can easily start it as 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 an eight, ten year old. I'll also say you can easily also start it when, when they're starting to do the throwing. And not like they have to do it three times a week, but just just do some small precision exercises. Uh, because you know if they haven't trained it how do you expect them to do it in a match and and it's much better to to make a mistake uh, in a match than make mistakes when you're playing a game and all the parents are looking all the coaches and it real mean mean means a lot so yeah i think you can just do it but but don't overdo it just start with precision and do it correctly then you can start really early um Oh, so many questions here, and that's just fantastic. I just have to over have to overview here. Um, yeah, again, a question about the best tips. I'll say if you before you have my books about the long, fast, and clever throw-ins, you can see on thomascronomark.com uh, later. Just you can see it already now. Uh, I'll say that start with, with throw in precision. You can do that no matter if it's a kid, a youth teams, amateur teams, pro teams, and then try to create some space between the players and don't be afraid of throwing in into the free space. So that's, that's, and then you can learn about the 40 to 50 throw in tools, specific work with the long throw in. And so when, when you're either reading my book or inviting me, uh, I have to answer that. Um, Yes. Can you tell us how to teach women to throw? <clears throat> this is all about men so far. I'll say for me, it was not all about men. It was, um, if I have mentioned men, it's just a coincidence because women can do exactly the same. It's really, really important throw-ins in men's football. But I'll say it's perhaps even more important in women's football. That may sound strange. Uh, uh, strange but but the reason why is that most women are throwing shorter than men let's just say that most women are perhaps throwing between uh, i don't know 12 and and 22 meters uh most men are throwing between 18 and 30 meters w when they haven't done any training and because of women are not throwing so far as men they'll have a shorter throw in then they'll also have a, a smaller throwing error. And it also means that women are more under pressure. So the long, fast and clever throw-ins, these different throwing tools, the, the, the ability to create space is actually, I think, even more uh, important for women than it is for men, even though it's really important for men. So so again, I'll say all this, uh, all this throwing stuff is really, really uh, important for women too. So, and I'll say I have, I have I have been coaching uh, women's to, uh, teams too. So I think that women are just fantastic. They're really focused. So if some of you out there are coaching girls or women, no matter if it's youth, amateur or pro, it's really important for women and perhaps even more important for them. So just do the throwing coaching with, with them too. That's, uh, I can only recommend it. I've done it myself several times. There's a question from me. Do you talk about and coach player movement in throw-ins? How does player position from a throw-in situation change based on where the throw-in is taken from? Yeah, just to, I can't remember how much I said, but again, if you're having a, a throw-in zone one, defending zone, then you're often under a lot of pressure. You have a short angle. So under a big risk if you're losing the ball. Um, but also you can say if you can play out of pressure, it's um, yeah, it's really good. You have a good chance then for, for creating chances afterwards or, or goals yourself. In the middle middle zone, it's perhaps the easiest place to do a throw in because you have 180 degrees angle. Uh, you can involve both the defenders, the midfielders and the strikers. And then we have the, the attacking zone. I'm just showing it here to, to make it easier for you to see. But of course we have Again, like the defending zone is a little bit more tight, there's less space. But again, you can say you can really take some risk here because if you're losing the ball, it's not so dangerous. Uh, but but if you're getting like just 
pretty good space in, in the final third, then it can really give you chances and it uh, can really give you the uh, opportunity to uh, to score. So um, I think that was not all questions, but I just want to scroll here. Let's see if I can do it here. Oh, I can do it here, yeah. Um, Jack is asking, do you coach particular throw-ins for specific part of the pitch? For example, clever throw-ins in the this defensive third or quick throw-ins in the middle third? No, it's just the long, fast and clever throw-ins in, in all three zones. So, and and different kind of throw-ins are giving or are giving different kinds of options and opportunities. So I'll just do um, each of my three parts of the philosophy. I'm doing that in all three zones. Um, I'm just scrolling a little bit here. Okay. Bop, 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 bop. And sorry again if if I'm jumping over some of your questions, but uh, but now I think over hundred questions. <laughs> so really appreciate that. Appreciate that all of you out there. Um, Have you ever worked with Mauricio Sari? No, I have never worked with him. So um, yeah, but I think he's done some um, some work with the throw-ins too. I think it's it's really different from my. I, of course, I'm not a, an expert in in Sari's throwing coaching, but it seems a little bit more like American football playbook, where we're doing some really specific things and then make players run specific ways. For me, it's more like building the players' throwing intelligence up with basic things. So instead of having uh, 10 uh, uh, options in the playbook we have millions of options if you're counting the players fantasy and creativity and so so but again sorry fantastic coach so um yeah he's done well um thomas i will I, save you now as you've asked a lot of these questions um yeah. i've had a couple of questions for you myself and i'm sure we yeah. can get some of these guys to um to, you know send these questions in and you can maybe answer them at another time rather than trying to go through 150 million yeah, questions. yeah sorry which is, sorry which is fantastic okay, thanks guys for all of your questions i mean for me this has been fascinating as well um of the i've been kind of sitting here with a couple of questions of my own and i think one of mine for you thomas is you've been invited into a lot of clubs to you know use your specialist skill to help these clubs develop have you seen a difference i guess in the environment within the club dependent on the head coach. I mean, in Liverpool's case, obviously everyone knows a lot about Jürgen Klopp and how he's very open with his players and with his staff. Um, in terms of being accepting of elements of the game that can give them an edge, which obviously we've seen it help Liverpool in that completion of possession from one year to the next. You can say if, if I have to, if we should talk about the environment in Liverpool FC, it's really, and and I like to say, I, I think I, I know a bit about work environments and work culture because I'm, I'm also a motivational speaker, been 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 publishing a, a, a bestseller book in Denmark about work joy and, and so, and I've been making talks for over 500 companies. So I'm working with that also besides the throw-ins. I'll say if I should, should look at, at Liverpool's uh, work, culture or club culture i'll say it's it has almost a perfect balance between having fun and having a good time and being 100 percent serious if you go if you're having too much fun having too much a good time then you you won't get the real workload and real focus if you are too serious everything gets too stiff and too people are too tired and people are afraid of making mistakes and so so I think in Liverpool, there's almost a perfect balance between, you know, just in five minutes, we can have the best times of our life and laughing and just have fun in training. And then five minutes after, it's 100% focus. So, of course, it's, I think it's really a big part of it. It's, of course, uh, Jürgen Klopp himself, why he's, he's really got these abilities himself. But, uh, so, so, but I also think that... that you know the the ability in the club to in the club i get the feeling that that we are not working as i but instead we're working as we so it's not about i have to have success or i have to get the ball or i have to create or, or get possession at a throw in no it's more like we so i think that's one of the big secrets not not only among the players but also in in the whole club for example 
people are really helping, uh, really willing to help each other, and, and they are listening to it to each other and open-minded. And it's not only in the like the cylinders of of your your own like like in in your own work area. It's also uh, you know the physical coaches, the analysis people, the people with nutrition, people who are doing uh, us uh, service guards or what they called. Uh, you know, people are just sharing knowledge and helping each other. So I think that's one of the secrets behind the success of Liverpool FC. So, and it's the same with me. I'm not coming and saying I'm a big throwing guru. I know everything. Then shut up. No, I try to listen. I try to to be smarter. And, and sometimes there is a, for example, I can remember when I was in Ajax last season, there was a, like this season, last summer, there was one of the coaches who said, yeah, this exercise is really good. Also that that they get a point for five passes, but you have you thought about bringing small goals into that exercise? Yeah, so nee, I never thought about that. I did, so I improved. I made my exercise better because some other guy there to come to me to to say, hey, can improve that. Also in Liverpool, in one training, there was one of the players. We did an exercise where we, I made it directly into the pitch. And then when, when we had done it two minutes, one of the players said to me, couldn't we do it in a 45 degree angle so it was more relevant for, for, for or more match relevant. And then I said, oh, I have to think about it just a few seconds. And then I thought, hey, I think you're right, let's do it. So I think one of the secrets in Liverpool is that people are willing to help each other, not because of their own success, but because of the team's success or the club's success. So. In general, I think it's fantastic to, to work in Liverpool and, and I don't think you'll find that kind of environment, not on many places, not only in football, but also in, uh, your, you know, in, in normal work life. Yeah, I agree. One of the um, questions I had for you as well was based around, you said you do a lot of your own analysis um, and obviously a lot of these clubs have their own analysis teams. I mean, Liverpool, for example, are very famous for their analysis that they put in, in since the FSG um, took over. But when you come in, does that work that the analysis team inform your work? You know, do you collaborate in a way to make sure that you're all getting the right information across um, when it comes to developing these, these set pieces and these throw-ins especially? Yeah, I work really a lot with the analysis department in, in Liverpool. So, uh, first of all, it's them who's, who's sending me uh, the, the raw video files of the throw-ins and send them back. But also when I'm at Melwood, I'm also talking a lot with the analysis team. And, um, and, and, and of course, we are sometimes measuring things in different ways because, you, again, with data and analysis, you can measure that in a thousand ways. But I think we're really good at, at explaining what do I mean here and what's happened here. And then, of course, Sometimes we're speaking two different languages because, uh, yeah, first of all, uh, I'm another person. And second of all, they have other education than me in, in analysis. But I think in, in, every, in every part uh, of, of life, it, it's about, you know, try to talk the same language. So we try to do that in analysis too. So, so in every club, I mean, doesn't matter if it's Liverpool, Ajax, Kent, I'm, I'm uh, cooperating with with the analysis apartment. It doesn't matter if it's a gigantic analysis apartment like Liverpool's or like Ghent who has uh, one or two guys uh, or, or even smaller clubs who almost have no way. It's the, the assistant coach who are doing all the analysis. So I try to, to cooperate and, and try to speak the same language. Perfect. Yes. My last question to you, I know we've taken up a lot of your time and you've been sitting here answering questions and reading a lot. Um, when we talk about the patterns, the blocking, the technique of the throwing, if we put it all together, what do you think is the key component to ensure that retention of the ball is successful? Um, you know, is it timing of the movement of the players? Is it understanding the cue that the throw is given? Um, what would be the one key takeaway you would give to the coaches on the call to say, focus on this and then build everything around there? I'll say, first of all, it's, it's, it's to understand that throw in position is mostly about creating space. And it's also about that it's not, I have to get the ball, it's we have to get the ball. So instead of only saying, oh, if I don't get the ball, I'll, I'll stop. No, if you don't get the ball, you, you, sh you should perhaps be running, still be running, so you're creating space for your teammate. So of course, there are a lot of basic things I'm coaching the, the players in drills so they can do all these things. Of course, there are all my 
40 to 50 tools and, and everything. And of course, they need that to be world class like Liverpool at the throw ins. But in general, you can, as a coach, you can start by saying it's, it's, it's about creating space here and it's a teamwork. We have to work everybody, not only when we have a throw in, but also when we have to mark the opponent's throw in. Because if it's only eight or nine out of 11 players who are involved or know the things, then it's, um, yeah, then it, then it won't work so good. So I'll recommend. Of course, sometimes I'm working with only the fullbacks, but most of the times it's it's all the players. And I recommend that to all coaches who are listening to this, include all your players because if it has to work the best way, you have to, to, to let the, all the players know what we're doing. So uh, perfect. Um, and again, thank you so much for taking the time out today to join us. Thank you for sharing all of this information. It's been really really valuable and, and fantastic and and the stories and, and all of the things that you've done have been fascinating and and hopefully it will help everyone here and continue to develop and become better so big thank you from me and to everyone who joined the call today thank you guys for joining us you're welcome thank you thomas and goodbye all <laughs>